Hi, I'm Bob the Hollow, here to talk about the Kingdom of Lothric, Faron Keep and the First Flame. This video is going to be longer than usual, so please bear with me. I'll start with Faron Keep because I think it will be the easiest and because it's the next in line after the profane capital in Irfil. I really like the Undead Legion of Faron, or Abyss Watchers, and it saddens me that I won't have much to say about them. We already know that they have taken after the task of Artorius, of fighting the Abyss, that their power derives from Wolf's blood, which is believed to be Sif's, and that the location itself probably used to be Darkwood Garden in a past age, in Ulasil before that. A couple of misconceptions that I've seen around are about the crews in Smoldering Lake, and why are the Abyss Watchers fighting each other. Some people draw connections between the Chaos Demons and the Grues, but there aren't any. They are descendants of the Acolytes of Faron Keep, and Hazel, their leader's daughter, seems quite human-like. They didn't come from the lake, they just found their way down there through the catacombs beneath Faron Keep, and we have seen it before, people being twisted in the same manner that they were in the citizens of Ulasil. You don't need demons for that, just a little bit of dark. And regarding the fighting among the Abyss Watchers, since some of them have been tainted with the dark, the ones that haven't are trying to put them to rest. They're not mad, they're just carrying out their solemn duty. I also think that the Crystal Sage was planted within their ranks to undermine them. He refined their sorceries with the knowledge from the Grand Archives, and that was the reason for the Acolyte's downfall. It may sound a bit strange now, but it will make sense once I have talked about the Grand Archives. And finally, we arrive at Lothric. This mighty kingdom is a deep and intricate stage, its power divided between its three pillars, the clerics, the knights and the scholars. They were founded on the strength of its knights, they worshipped the sun and the warriors of sunlight covenant. Faith in the old gods gave the clerics a high position of power and their miracles bolstered the power of the knights. This bright kingdom must have been a shining beacon, but how does a kingdom such as this fall from grace? like every other kingdom that came before it, with the creeping darkness. I have talked about Sullivan's origin in the last video, and I think he plays a part here as well, but I'd like to talk about the Queen for a moment. Many believe the Queen to be Guinevere and Rosaria to be her daughter, Gertrude, or for Rosaria herself to be Guinevere, Queen of Lothric. I think Rosaria is the Queen, but not Guinevere. First, let's make a case for Rosaria being the queen. There is the obvious comparison between goddess of fertility and mother of rebirth, but I think the biggest clue would be in the Cathedral Knights. They are called Cathedral Knights, but they come from Lothric. They can actually be found in Lothric as well, in the garden where King Osiris resides. Their great shields bear the emblem of an old king of Lothric, and one of them in particular, located just before Osiris, drops a magic stone plate ring, which is granted to royal palace guards. So, this royal guard's duty would be to defend the king and queen, Osiris and Rosaria. Another small connection between Rosaria and Lothric is the fact that Ringfinger Leonhard has the lift chamber key to the dark wraith at the bottom of the high wall of Lothric. If she were the queen, Rosaria could have given it to him. Now, about Guinevere. The item descriptions most commonly used as evidence for Guinevere to be the Queen are the Divine Blessing, the Sun Princess Ring, and the miracle Bountiful Sunlight. Holy Water, blessed by the Queen of Lothric, initially revered as a goddess of fertility and bounty. In Dark Souls 1, this item was a holy water blessed by Guinevere herself, yes, but here it only says that it was blessed by the Queen and it says that she was revered as a goddess, but in the Japanese description it actually says that she was compared to a goddess. Also, in Dark Souls 1, the Divine Blessing cured Cursed Build-Up, while in Dark Souls 3 it has no effect on the Build-Up whatsoever. And, ring associated with Guinevere, Princess of Sunlight. Guinevere left her home with a great many other deities and became a wife and mother, raising several heavenly children which a lot of people connect to Gertrude being called the Heavenly Daughter, but the description in Dark Souls 3 leaves out a very important piece of information. 
A description for the same item in Dark Souls 1 says that the Princess of Sunlight, Guinever, left an Orlando along with many other deities and later became wife to Flame God Flame. So the Divine Blessing could be a hint at best and the ring is just a red herring. Not much to go on here, I suppose. A special miracle granted by the Princess of Sunlight, the miracles of Guinever loved as both mother and wife bestowed their blessing on a great many warriors. This miracle was acquired in Dark Souls 1 as a drop from a piasca, who was believed to have been a servant to Guinever and, in Dark Souls 2, as a reward for ranking up in the Blue Sentinel's Covenant, hardly an item given exclusively by Guinever herself. But here the twist would be that it is transposed from Rosario's soul. Well, soul of a stray demon can be transposed into Havel's ring, but that doesn't make the demon and Havel one and the same. Rosario and Guinever don't have to be the same person for Ludlith to craft this miracle, they just have to be intrinsically connected. Which brings us to the next point, Rosaria isn't Guinevere, she's Guinevere's mother. Ring bestowed upon the fingers of Rosaria, invaders who seek tongues for their goddess. It is said that Rosaria, mother of rebirth, was robbed of her tongue by her firstborn and has been waiting for their return ever since. There is no mention of Gertrude being a mother, unless you count the angel in her vision as her firstborn, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. And the Queen of Lothric had many children, but there is no evidence that any of them would have turned against her in this manner. Ring of the Sun's Firstborn, who inherited the light of Gwyn, the First Lord. The Sun's Firstborn was once a god of war, until he was stripped of his stature as punishment for his foolishness. No wonder his very name has leaped from the annals of history. The firstborn was exiled by his father, but the reason for it has never been revealed. Now, we know that the nameless king is Gwyn's firstborn, and that has led many people to believe that he was exiled for siding with the dragons, even though he was a dragon slayer at first, like his father. But after the great war against the ancient dragons, a dragonless age followed. Even Hawkeye Gu put down his great bow after Calamit was killed, since there were no dragons left to hunt and he would have sided with the dragons after he was exiled, otherwise they wouldn't have built statues for him in the first place. It doesn't quite add up, but if he is indeed Rosaria's firstborn, then attacking her should be reason enough for Gwyn to disavow him. But why would he attack her? Rosaria's fingers collect tongues in her name. Some do it to be reborn, others do it to help comfort their voiceless goddess. Rosaria's Covenant is an invading covenant. The red eye orbs being related to New London and Kaf's dark reefs, it deeply implicates her with the dark. Her current home is the Cathedral of the Deep. There we can see the impaled mangroves outside her chambers, but whatever fighting happened there, they all coexist peacefully now. The Cathedral Knights, Rosaria's defenders, walk among the deacons of the deep and the mangroves are left to their own devices. We've spoken already about how the clerics that came to the cathedral were way of the white clerics and were later corrupted. So it would make sense that they would fight Rosaria's presence at first if she were of the deep, but would embrace it after their fall into darkness, like Clint did. And since the cathedral knights are there on Rosaria's behest, their armor's description, repulsive creatures of the deep are sure to attract the foolish made me think that it might be referring to Rosaria after all, and the foolish may be the neighboring Pharaoh legion. And so, the nameless king found out the truth about his mother, her dark nature. He struck her down and tried to convince his father of her betrayal, but he wouldn't listen. How could he? He was in love. He didn't betray Gwyn, he tried to protect him. When the eldest son was stripped of his deific status, he left this on his father's coffin, perhaps as a final farewell. It doesn't sound like a son that has a grudge against his father. At least, not to me. Dark Souls 3 brings closure to the series. Just as it gave us Gwyn's firstborn, it also gave us his wife. It tells us why he was exiled and why she is never mentioned. Being both Gwyn's and Osiris' wife, we see now that she follows the same pattern in both occasions by breaking the royal bloodline of a potential threat. The nameless king and Guinevere left their home. 
Gwyndolin and Priscilla were deformed and hidden from the world. Prince Lothric is sick, and Lorien was crippled by the curse that binds them. Gertrude and Ocelot are locked away, and after her job was done, she simply disappeared. Now, let's go back to Sullivan. Like many others, I believe that he was the first of the scholars, mentioned on the Soul Stream spell. The most obvious evidence for this is the fact that the spell itself is guarded by an earful Outrider Knight. But that's not the only evidence of Sullivan's presence in Lothric, nor is it the only question answered by Sullivan being this first of the scholars. The scholars of the Grain Archives, Sorcerers by Craft, are now one of the three pillars, but it wasn't always like this. There was a short period in history where clerics and sorcerers opposed one another, thus it became necessary for even simple clerics to have some means of opposing magic. But even though the king had changed his stance towards the sorcerers, the knights and clerics were still distrustful. The knight is one of the three pillars of Lothric, said to have strengthened ties with the high priestess after the scholars acquired the grand archives, and the knights who formed the high priestess's guard carried great shields such as this, which were granted high magic absorption for her blessing. Something drastic changed Osiris's mind, even without the support of his followers. In his later years, Osiris became fascinated with dragons. He went mad, trying to harness his royal blood for a greater purpose, leading him to the heretics of the Grand Archives, where he discovered the twisted worship of Sif the Pale Drake. Well, there's another outrider knight in Lothric, who is also guarding something very important. Here, you can find Twinkling Titanites, a Titanite scale, and the Spirit Tree Crest Shield. The shield is used by the Drake Blood Knight in Arch Dragon Peak. After you kill him in Arch Dragon Peak, you can loot his armor set from the knight's dead body found after the fight with Osiris. But neither of them gives you the shield. The shield is in Lothric Castle, guarded by an earful Outrider Knight, brought by Sullivan. The entrance to Archdragon Peak is near Field Dungeon. Maybe he found the Drake Blood Knight and the Main Serpents around the path of the Dragon Statue area. Maybe he made his way to Archdragon Peak. Whatever happened there, he captured them, and along with other gifts such as Titanite Scales, Pale Pine Resin, and possibly the Dragon Scale Ring, he convinced Osiris that this was the way for him to create a worthy heir. Osiris handed the Grain Archives to Sullivan and the Sorcerers where Sullivan became the first of the scholars. Sullivan gave them the Soul Stream spell and the gargoyles stationed at its rooftop. He became a mentor to the young Prince Lothric and helped Osiris with his research and experiments, of which, I think, the wretches of Irfield Dungeon are failed attempts. Osiris's obsession and the darkness hidden within the archive store of knowledge devoured his will, and the king descended into madness. But Sullivan's influence doesn't end here. He played a part into breaking the entire royal family and the power of Lothric Kingdom itself. The first of the scholars doubted the linking of the fire and was alleged to be a private mentor to the royal prince. The prince, destined to be a lord of Cinder, was cherished by the royal family despite being born into Eunice, a frail and shrivel child. Lorien, raised as a knight, is said to have been left mute and crippled by his younger brother's curse. It is also said that Lorien, in fact, wished it so. Their union is rooted in a curse and perpetuated by grief. The prince was ill, but not cursed. The curse came afterwards. Lorien loved his younger brother, and they used his love against him. I believe that this curse was meant to heal Prince Lothric from his illness by transferring the strength of Lorien into him, for if that wasn't the supposed objective, then Lorien would have best served his brother by keeping his strength and fighting in his stead. And I also believe that there was a prior attempt at breaking Lorien, but it failed. Lorien's greatsword says that he single-handedly slayed the Demon Prince. There's no sign of it happening in the Smoldering Lake, but there are two demons relatively close by, one in the Undead Settlement and one in the bridge that leads to Lothric Castle. So it's more likely that it happened right here in Lothric. In the Grand Archives, there is a secret room where you find the Witch's Locks and Power Within, and just outside that room, you get a Chaos Gem, a relic of Isolif, a forbidden pyromancy, and a weapon fashioned from one of the daughters of the Witch of Isolif herself. It's rather strange for the Archives to be in the possession of these items, but 
with the basins and skulls, it looks to me like a ritual took place in this room. A secret ritual to call forth the demons. So, that's Prince Lothric and Lorien. Ocelot was twisted by Osiris' research into Sif the Scalus, and Gertrude's vision of an angel, I think, was also the making of Sullivan. In my video about Irithel, I connected Sullivan with the Pilgrims of the Dark and the Dark Lurker from Dark Souls 2, and even though Sullivan doesn't really look much like an angel, if he assumed an appearance that even slightly resembled that of the Dark Lurker, that would be angel-like enough for me. This encounter left her blind and mute, and the angelic faith that spawned from it eventually led to her imprisonment. Without the king, the queen or Lorien, the mantle of Rue would be Prince Lothrix, but he refused it. He secluded into a room filled with empty chairs where he would wait out the end of the world. Effective leadership of Lothric's forces fell to the High Priestess, and Emma branded Gertrude a heretical. Remember that her faith doesn't have to go against the linking of the fire, it just has to challenge the current accepted faith in order to be persecuted by it. But Gertrude was deeply involved with the Knights of Lothric, and some of them adhered to this new faith. At this point, Castle Grounds became a chessboard. Vort blocks exit from the castle, and with the Pilgrims of Londor and the Dancer of the Boreal Valley at its doorsteps, Emma blocked the entrance to the castle at her cathedral. The scholars locked themselves inside the Grand Archives, cutting off Emma's access to Prince Lothric. She had to keep most of her forces fighting the winged knights, but managed to place knights of her own outside Prince Lothric's room, with the elevator that bypasses the Grand Archives. They are all trapped, waiting. Following. Some of the clues to this standstill are easier to piece together than others, and at least the ones that I found more interesting. In the bridge that leads to Lothric Castle with the stray demon, you see a lot of bodies from dead warriors, but none from the pilgrims. You can find them before and after the demon, but none around it. The soul of the stray demon says that it was once the gatekeeper of Lothric, but not whom he was keeping out, and it seems to me that it wasn't the Pilgrims of Londor. Further ahead, these Pilgrims can be found past Vort and before the Lothric Knights, showing that Emma stopped their progress at her cathedral. And there's no apparent reason for her death, but I think she was keeping the Dancer out through miracles. Once her energy was spent, she died and the Dancer made her way inside. You can actually see this effect on the window pane above the cathedral's door. It has a glowing light while Emma is alive, and the glow disappears once she's dead. Next, at the Grand Archives, there are three Lothric Knights, but all of them use crystal sorcery rather than miracles, showing that they are no longer allied with the High Priestess, but with the Scholars instead. And last, there is the lift that bypasses the Grand Archives. When you first get to it, it's stuck, it doesn't move. That's not unusual in the game, but have you noticed that this lever never works, even after you have activated the elevator? That's because the real lever is down below, with this fellow holding a titanite slab. The slab's writing has actually been translated by Scarecrow13, and I'll leave a link in the description, you should check it out, he did an amazing job. It is basically a tale of the rise of the gods and fall of the dragons, and an omen of man's ascension and the end of the Age of Fire. These characters aren't the same we see when casting miracles, so we can't be sure that the inhabitants of Lothric can read them, but in any case, Titanite slabs have always been associated with the gods. That person at the bottom of the elevator pit was given this slab as a sign of trust and a reminder of his divine duty. The scholars didn't know that Emma could use the elevator to sneak in soldiers. For all intents and purposes, this elevator could only be activated from the top floor, past the archives. Another trapped soul, waiting in the dark. So now we have these two characters, Rosaria and Sullivan, worming their dark intent at Lothric, and it wouldn't be such a huge leap to assume that they could have worked together. The game actually provides us with the evidence to draw this connection. The white feathers connecting the powers of Prince Lothric, the angelic faith in Rosaria's mangroves, the fact that Rosaria is the Cathedral of the Deep, and also on the Ashen items. 
Before I go into the items themselves, I believe that the Cemetery of Ash was created by the Queen with the assistance of Sullivan. There is a grave in Lothric that sees no visitors, a dark place where ruthless warriors rest. The Queen of Lothric alone cared to wish the poor souls good fortune. This description, the presence of cathedral grave wardens in untended graves and the following items gave me that impression. The first of these items that you would come across is probably the Ashenesta's flask, which turns a bonfire's heat cold. We've seen magic like that before in the skull used to hold the profaned coal, and frost in general is associated with Irithel. The Ashenesta's ring increases the Ashen Flask's effects, and it was a treasure brought before Lothric's queen, and Sullivan would have given her this ring, much like the treasures that he brought before Cyrus. And lastly, there is the Hidden Blessing, whose effect mirrors that of the Ashenesta's Flask. I think it's worth noting that this item, being hidden or a secret, contrasts with her other holy water, the Divine Blessing. The latter is akin to miracles and bears her public face, while the hidden one shows her true colors. None of these items' descriptions mention the linking of the fire. In fact, the flask even goes as far as saying that turning a bonfire's heat cold is quite befitting of an unkindled. Keep in mind that the queen was the only one who visited these graves, where the unkindled are reborn, so Rosaria, mother of rebirth, left all of this and she also left us our burial gifts. Being gifts, by definition, they aren't things we had before, they were left with us when we were placed in these graves. And these gifts also serve as a link between Rosaria and the Queen of Lothric, in between Rosaria and Sullivan. The important ones are the two Queen's holy waters, the cracked red eye orbs which link the Queen to Rosaria and the young white branch. This often overlooked item links Rosaria to Sullivan and explains the purpose of the giant of the undead settlement. The giant came from Irithil, judging by his helm and the fact that all other giants in Dark Souls 3 are in service of Irithil. It looks like he is protecting the white trees, but there would be no reason for him to do that, until you consider the burial gift, which is given to us in order to grant safe passage to the Cathedral of the Deep and the Lords of Cinder. I don't know why Sullivan came to Lothric in the first place. Maybe he coveted the secrets of the Grand Archives. Maybe he meant to probe this new power rising at the borders of Irithil. Maybe he was drawn by Rosaria's enticing darkness. But whatever reason brought him to Lothric, he ended up working with Rosaria with a shared goal. And that was Londor's goal. The concept of using powerful souls to access the kiln of the first flame is as old as the series, but this ritual with the frowns is new. In theory, it was created to help Lothric become a lord of Cinder himself. The former lords are bound by duty and, should they choose not to comply, the unkindled ones would bring them by force. Their souls combined, creating Prince Lothric entrance to the kiln. That is a good and acceptable explanation, one the entire kingdom would support, but Rosaria's reasons were quite different. In the Firelink Shrine of the Untended Graves we find the Hollow's Ashes. It takes but a brief glance at this thing to easily envision Londor, the foreboding land of Hollows. Londor had its roots here, and so did its plan. We know that they need to find the Dark Lord in order to seize the First Flame and that the Dark Lord would need the Dark Sigil, granted by the Pilgrims, in order to do so. The Pilgrims of Londor have come to Lothric Castle, where Prince Lothric, tutored by Sullivan, has learned to doubt the linking of the flame. He was supposed to be the Dark Lord, but refused that role as well. And maybe the Pilgrims' offer of true power could have changed his mind, but no one expected that Emma would be able to lock down the castle like she did. Enter the Unkindled, the backup plan. We who rise through the toll of the bell, we who have the metal to bring down the Lords of Cinder, cared by and shepherded by Rosaria, we are given the Dark Sigil and we become the truth that is the Dark Lord. Londor, Rosaria, Sullivan, Lashandra and beyond. Behind everything is the Dark.
always the dark. A ring depicting a snake that could have been, but never was, a dragon. Snakes are known as creatures of great avarice, devouring prey even larger than themselves. If one's shackles are cause for discontent, perhaps it is time for some old-fashioned greed. It's easy to see Fremd as a servant of light and Kaf as a servant of dark. I am the primordial serpent, King Seeker Fremd. I am the primordial serpent, Dark Stalker Kaf. We all tend to see things as black and white. I wish to elucidate your fate. Only I know the truth about your fate. And this is exactly what they wanted you to believe. Your fate is to succeed the great Lord Gwyn. The other serpent, Frampt, lost his sense and befriended Lord Gwyn. The new great Lord, may you enjoy serendipity and may the Age of Fire perpetuate. You must destroy the fading Lord Gwyn, who has coddled fire and resisted nature and become the fourth Lord, so that you may usher in an Age of Dark. But in Dark Souls 1, in the Dark Ending, both Karf and Fremd are there to serve you, Dark Lord. My Lord, bless thy safe return. Let Karf and Fremd serve your highness. We are here to serve your highness. Let the true dark be cast upon the world. Our Lord hath returned. But that was not the true Lord of Hollows. He didn't take the flame, he simply walked away from it. And so, the search for the true Dark Lord continues. And there can be no Dark Lord without a flame to be taken. The serpents have always controlled the access to the first flame, the Lord Vessel, Nashandra, the ritual of the fronds. And just like the profane flame, it is a flame born in the dark. It is the serpent's tool, they have created it, and it has always served their purposes. They have used it to fell the everlasting dragons, to crumble every empire, to manipulate every lord and dark lord. Men and gods alike, prisoners to the cycle of linking and fading, should they can find the one that can harness the flame's true power. And the worst part is, they don't seem like the type that would share power. I don't know what their end goal is, but I'm guessing that from man's point of view, it's probably not good. With fire, they say, a true king can harness the curse. Inherit fire and harness the dark. Such is the calling of a true leader. A lie. But I knew no better. You know not the depth of dark within you. It grows deeper still, the more flame you covet. With dark unshackled, a curse will be upon us. And men will take their true shape 